So let's look at some examples of this in the New Testament. Well, what's the New Testament saying about women? How are they um, viewing women? How are they portraying women? Um, we're all familiar with Priscilla and Aquila, right? Um, Priscilla um, and Aquila were very involved in Paul's ministry as, as workers, helpful with him. They started out in Rome, um, building a church there, and then we see them going over to Ephesus later and, and being very implemental in the church um, there at Ephesus. Um, and so we have these two characters that are mentioned um, quite frequently in scripture, and we always see them mentioned together, Priscilla and Aquila. And what's unique here is that in several of these verses, you have that very thing, Priscilla mentioned first, and then Aquila, um, which is kind of unique in, in Paul's writing and is um, a, a just a cool, cool um, point that's going on here that he would mention a woman before a man not necessarily meaning that a woman is uh, had more authority than the man, but just like the fact of, well, she's not, Priscilla isn't defined by her relationship to Aquila. It's just Priscilla and Aquila. They're two human beings that are helping out, right? Um, and this also happens with several other women. We have Lydia, Phoebe, and Chloe mentioned in several different scriptures. Um, they're listed for you that are identified just as themselves. They're not linked with any male figure, daughter of, wife of, sister of, certain male. It's just them listed, right? So this is important into the social context of, of the day, of what's going on. When we think of the new, uh, the new Testament era, the first century, my bias is, is that women aren't recognized without, without men, without a more authoritative figure. But here, scripture says they're just mentioning women. So they are recognized um, outside of their relationship to a, a man. So that's important. Um, so these, these examples uh, found in literature show us that women weren't viewed as lowly as to not be mentioned at all. They were actually prominent figures and had prominent roles and statuses within all of these different stories. And these are just a couple examples I'm giving you guys. Um, this is not to argue that the only perception that this um, time period of literature paints is a high perception, as we saw with Josephus. It, that's not the case. A lot of times it's in a negative light. But the fact is that women were still mentioned means that they still played a part in society and were not quite as marginalized as some think. Um, so yeah, that, so that's a cool, cool point. So not only do we get a glimpse of women's social standing in literature, but we also see women being involved in different activities, um, public activities and public works within society. Okay, so setting the stage, did women have responsibilities in the home to bear and raise children and run a household? Absolutely. Let's all be on the same page where, yes, that is a thing that's going on here. Um, but was that their sole purpose when we look at ancient societies? Was that the only thing that women were good for? Well, context, material data of what we're finding says differently. It looks like women worked on the farms, they labored in the fields, they wore, watched the herds, they bought and sold and rented and owned property. They ran businesses, they had staffs that worked for them, they owned slaves, they were artists and vendors. Um, this wasn't every woman in Greco-Roman society, of course not. Elite women had more means to uh, operate and own their own businesses, but this doesn't mean that lower class women were restricted from achieving any kind of commercial freedom and restricted to the home. So looking at some exa examples, let's go back to um, Lydia. We find her story in Acts 16, where verse 14 mentions a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira is a seller of purple goods. A seller of purple goods means that she's got money. This is a luxury item that she's selling. And so some scholars even say that she um, is one, one of the women that funds part of Paul's ministry. So you may be looking at this wondering why, why there are shells up here. Um, I just kind of wanted to get into the backstory of, of purple goods, uh, luxury goods. Um, purple was extracted from a certain um, sea snail um, out of deep into the ocean. Uh, it's a natural pigmentation that comes underneath these shells. And so it was a very lengthy, very meticulous process to go out, 
dive deep into the sea, get these shells, crush them up so finely so that you can extract um, the dye, expose it to oxygen so that the, the dye could seep, um, seep out. And it took a very long process to get this color, natural color purple. Um, and this is why we see later um, purple becoming a symbol of royalty, right? In like medieval times, people are wearing purple and this is a sign of like kings and, and royalty. Um, and it's because that this getting purple dye was such a lengthy process, it wasn't easy. It's not a primary color we can just find in nature. Uh, we do find it, but it's like at the bottom of the ocean and it takes a long time to like get that dye to come about. Um, and so that's just a little tidbit of, of purple for you, now you know. Um, so going back to some of their occupations, um, we see specific occupations being vendors of garments and textiles made of wool and linen, just like what Lydia was wrapped up into this world, selling purple as a dye to be in, used in textile clothing production. Um, women sold and uh, meat and produce. They were shopkeepers, innkeepers, hairdressers, midwives, even professional mourners. All of these things were done in the public realm that involved women being present and active in public society. So let's look at some evidence for all of this. Um, here is a relief uh, carving uh, showing some, a woman in the marketplace at her short, at a shop owned probably by her family, and she's selling some produce and some meat. You can see some chickens hanging up back there, um, meat to um, local vendors in the marketplace. We also have examples of hairdressers, as I mentioned. Um, this is a first century marble relief found on a funerary sarcophagi. Um, <clears throat> we have here the setup of uh, women doing hair. And most likely what's going on in, in this context is what we have lower class women performing this job on um, women of elite status that actually like pay money for people to come in to do their hair. Um, and we also have midwives. Sorry, this is kind of graphic, <laughs> but I just wanted to get, there's examples of this, um, of relief going on, of women being in paid positions to help deliver um, babies. And we also have professional mourners, as I mentioned. Um, we see this popping up in the Gospels. Um, they provide examples of mourners that come in, and they mention them in Mark 16 and Luke 23. And they describe women performing different burial preparations of specifically Jesus' body after his crucifixion. Um, so this was a, a real job that women um, did in the public sphere. They would go and they would cry um, at, at deaths of others and then prepare, prepare their body for, um, for death. So it's important to know that a woman's social position was not derived from her specific profession, but rather was resultant from the manner in which she performed her work. This is essential when we are looking at and interpreting ancient history and what's going on. This is different from men who derived their social esteem from their work, not the manner in which they did their work. Women gained social prestige from their virtues, which were promoted as being a faithful wife and mother, working diligently, caring for the home, right? This is where they're getting their, their social identity, is how, how good are they doing their work. This culture was driven by honor and shame. A woman was perceived as respectable in society if she upheld the family's honor. And that's what she wanted to do. Uh, this is very, very different from our Western individualistic society that says it's, uh, it's okay to do what's good for you. We're very self-centered in our modern Western society. We don't really think about the family unit as a whole in a lot of cases. We do what we want to do. This is so different from what's going on in Eastern context in the first century. They're not thinking about themselves on an individual level. They're thinking about the family unit and what brings honor to that. Um, so this idea of honor in society carried over um, in the domestic spaces, jobs that women partook in in public served as a means of sustaining the family. So this oftentimes looked like women um, 
the products and produce that they are selling in the marketplace well was uh, grown up at their, their house or the, the textiles, um, clothing products that they're selling in the market, they made at home. And it looks like men and women at the home working together to make these things to sell them in the public, sp the public space. So he's working the fields, she's picking up the uh, produce behind it, she's harvesting, she's going and do these things. It's very much family unit working together on the home front and in the public space of running the marketplace. So now let's turn and look at women's participation in uh, Christian communities. What can we say here? Women were highly, highly involved, as we've seen, uh, in Jesus' ministry and in the establishment of the early church. In fact, a lot of women uh, were the financial contributors to Jesus' ministry. Luke 8 describes uh, a group that's traveling with Jesus as he preached throughout the villages, and he specifically mentions two women. Um, the verse says, Joanna, wife of Chusa, Herod's household manager, and Susanna, and many others who provided for them out of their means, meaning these women had money. Okay, they are the ones that are funding um, what's going on here, funding Jesus' ministry. And there's been a lot of, like, research done on Joanna specifically, trying to find out, okay, who, who really is she? Mentioned she's the wife of Chusa, who is Herod, meaning Herod, the, um, the great here, his, his household manager. Actually, I think that's wrong. I think it's Herod Philip, one of those. But anyways, you get the setting. It's a... Uh, the ruler Herod um, here going on. Um, so that's she's she's known in society. She's a big wig, and she's in this um, studying and providing funding for um, Jesus' ministry. And then we also have, we see women had significant roles in Jesus' life. We have Mary, the mother of Jesus, who is recorded in Luke as being the first to hear of the coming Messiah. She's the first one to hear this news that there's a Messiah coming. That's pretty significant. And then in Mark 16 recounts um, that women, Mary Magdalene, Mary, mother of Jesus, and Salome were the first to discover the empty tomb and were charged with reporting this news to the disciples. I'm sorry, what? A group of women are the first to see the risen Messiah? Yeah, that's huge, right? Like, that's a big deal. And they're, they're charged with taking it and reporting this news back to the disciples. That's pretty significant. If they were nobody in society, like, would that be taking place? And we all know the story. Peter, Peter's Peter. He doesn't believe them. He's like, I'm going to go see for myself. Um, but I think he would have done that either way if it were, if it were women, women or men telling, recounting the story. Um, so that just gives us... Um, a little bit of insight. Um, the New Testament also described the role of women who are working with the apostles. We see specific examples including Lydia, like I mentioned, Priscilla, Phoebe, the mother of Rufus, Chloe, and Lois, and Eunice, who are all fellow workers with Paul. Scripture describes them as evangelists and teachers and women um, whose homes hosted churches. These women definitely definitely had positions within society. Um, some scholars believe that Christianity led um, to more public participation as Paul's teaching recommended celibacy over sexuality and therefore opposing the importance of marriage and procreation. Um, so this is a, an argument that some, some scholars take and even stretch to say that, that Christianity uh, in this setting was even more more freeing for women um, at times that gave them the freedom to, you don't have to get married to, in order to make it in society. If you want to be um, abstinent and focus on your faith and dedicate your life to the word, good for you, go do that. If you can't, hold out, by all means, get married. Um, and Paul, we see that Paul's not just addressing men here when he's saying that, he's also addressing women, which sheds light onto, okay, yeah, they had some standing in society to be able to, to hear that and take that from Paul. Um, so with all of that being said, we've examined the perceptions of women that were held in literature and seen in records and material mains of their participation in public society. Let's look at a different avenue um, to help out round out um, women's position in the um, Greco-Roman world. So what was legal activity like for women? Were they involved at all? What's going on here? 
Um, one archive that was found sheds light on this. It's called the Babatha Archive that was found um, in the Cave of Letters. Uh, this archive is a set of documents that was found along with several other artifacts and skeletons by a team led by uh, an archaeologist named Yigo Yadin. And as I mentioned in the Cave of Letters, which is located in the Wadi Nahal Hever near the Dead Sea. So we have a map up here showing um, the Dead Sea. We've got Jerusalem up there to um, the northwest. And then going along the Dead Sea, if any of you have been to Israel, uh, Nahal Hever is just south of En Gedi and a little bit north of Masada. And so we have the, a cave here that um, found some some archives in, some evidence in. Um, the documents were hidden in the cave for, uh, for protection from the events of the um, Bar Kokhba revolts that were happening around 132 um, CE as the Jews were hiding out um, from being slaughtered from the Romans at this time. So here's a picture of the actual caves. Um, if any of you are into rock climbing, archaeology is the job for you. You can uh, get up there and go get these caves out, uh, get the archives out of these caves. <laughs> so we have here, here's the, a picture of the actual, um, the document showing um, this archive included 35 documents spanning a time for, of 30 years. So all of these documents record legal, legal acts sh such as the sales and loans, deposits, gift and marriage contracts, um, they reveal a lot about, specifically about Babatha and her transactions within her family unit. Um, so we got within this disputes of guardianship, um, succession of ownership and property, the repayment of debt after, her, after the death of both of her husbands. She was married twice. Um, and they show the protection of rights of women, the, uh, the protection of women's rights um, that they possessed based on the death of their husband. So in the archive, we found a, a statement written by Judah, Babatha's second husband, and he writes, If I should go to my eternal home before you, you will reside and continue to be provided for from my house and from my properties until the time that my heirs will agree to give you the silver of your ketubah or your dowry. Uh, so this reveals that she was protected um, or her financial welfare, welfare was protected until her dowry could have been repaid. Um, Babatha, the archive mentions, was present at the court upon drawing up of this contract. Um, and so she's here having a say in these legal documents. So women were not out of the picture um, in these types of contexts. They were very much involved, very much had a say. They may have not been the one that actually signs the line saying, I, Babatha, agree to all of this. They had somebody signing for her, but she was there giving consent and permission. Yeah, I agree. I understand all of these things. You can sign for me. Um, so this is just a good example um, of what women, um, women's dealings with legal activity uh, from this time period. Okay, so why does any of this matter? Why does all of this data that I just dumped on you matter? Well, like I said at the beginning, we all have biases, and we all approach history with different biases. And this um, shows us how we interpret the world through those lenses. If we're going to be reading into ancient history, uh, or we are going to read into ancient history, what we want to see if we keep those lenses on, right? If we keep those biases on, then it's just going to be what we want from history, right? We need at least to be aware that these biases do exist. Um, I don't think you can ever qu completely get rid of these biases. It just is programmed in how our worldviews are. But if we're aware of them, we can do our best to interpret scripture for what it is. So what's our goal, like I said at the beginning? As biblical scholars, as historians, as archaeologists, our goal is exegesis. We want to take the text, we want to take history for what it is. That's it. No more than that. We do not want eisegesis. We don't want to read into the text and make it what we want it to be. Um, that's the point that we get when we study history, when we study scripture as archaeologists, 
I cannot take out of the ground, dig up out of the ground, and make it what I want it to be. It's there. It's factual. It is what it is. And I have to just ride with that, whether I want it to be that or not. Uh, so for example, doing this paper or this presentation is based off a paper I wrote two years ago. And I started the paper with the bias that women weren't really significant in the first century realm. And then as I was ended up writing the paper, I had the bias of no, women were of equal standing with men. And I realized that's wrong because that's what I wanted it to be. I wanted it to say that women had equal social standing with men during this time because of my personal agenda here. Um, so some concluding thoughts about um, women in the first century or Greco-Roman world of this time. Women were perceived highly and mentioned favorably, favorably by um, writers of literature. They had jobs in the marketplace and in the public sphere. Um, within the Christian context, they were actively involved in their communities. And women played a role and had a role in legal, um, legal activity that was happening during this time. So some concluding thoughts. After examining the textual um, material, um, textual data and material data, we can answer some questions. Um, were women in the Greco-Roman world marginalized, off to the sidelines, non-existent? No, they were not. Were women in the Greco-Roman world on equal social standing with men? No, they were not. Did women in the Greco-Roman world have a standing in society? Yeah, I think it's safe to say, yeah, they did. They were there, they were present, they were recognized, they weren't perched off to the side, um, but that doesn't mean that they were equal to men at this time period. Uh, that's all I have for you guys today. Thank you so much. <laughs>